welcome to this uh, virtual class on English literary and social history, which is uh, the first paper of the English core course under the new education policy. Now, this is a conditioning class, a warming up, actually. We'll get an outline summary, an overall idea of the paper. This is a PowerPoint presentation. And so let's go to the slides. This is the title, title slide, English Literary and Social History, Semester 1, Paper 1, English Course and Outline. So it is self-explanatory. We are going to have a gist of the paper here. Now the social and the literary. So here we are trying to grasp an idea. What is social and what is literary? Now we know the social, the word social is the adjective from the word society. So referring to society. And the word literary is the adjective from literature. So it refers to literature. Now here, the society and literature are connected. So literature we know is supposed to hold up the mirror to nature. That is literature reflects the society. It, it represents the society it is born out of. So we can use the word words, the landmark and the landscape, the environment, the milieu, the society that incubates, that leads to the growth of particular literature. The text is the landmark and the environment of the society is the landscape. So there is a two-way traffic between the text and the context, to put it in another way. Society impacts literary productions, the environment influences literary productions, and literary text reflect the society in which it is produced. For example, uh, Geoffrey Chaucer, his poetry no doubt will be influenced by the medieval English society. And in its turn, his poetry will reflect the society of the times. So if you read Chaucer, particularly the Canterbury Tales, you did not actually read English medieval history. You know the social conditions of the time. You know the social hierarchies. Uh, you know the uh, lives, lives of the people. So that is the two-way traffic between uh, society and literature. That is why social and literary history, we need to read together uh, in tandem to actually have a 360 view of the things. So literature represents social conditions and social conditions influence literary productions. Now, what is literary history? Literary, as I said, is the adjective form of literature. So the history of literature. Actually. Now, for the moment, we can uh, take literature as meaning imaginative writings or creative writings like poetry, like novels, like short stories, like plays, essays, etc. Now, how does literature evolve and develop? That is what literary history is about. Now, lit literature also does not remain stagnant uh, like in, uh, everything else. Different genres develop in different conditions and different concerns are also there uh, in different societies. The issues and concerns of the medieval writer will not be exactly the same as the issues and concerns of, say, a writer of our times. Society has evolved and literature will also have to deal with those changes. Now, different genres will develop. Now, when I say genre, genre is a technical term actually uh, in the register of literature. Genre means simply types or forms of literature. Like say, the epic is a particular genre. It's a narrative genre. The play is a dramatic genre. 
So different forms and types evolve with time. And this evolution has a connection with social conditions. And not only the forms or types, the subject matter, the issues and concerns, the topics of literature also evolve with the evolution of the society. Now, social history. Literary history we have understood from the previous slide. Now, what is social history? Of course, social history is the history of the society. Now, here we'll have to look at social history vis-a-vis -vis what is called political history and economic history. Actually, when we talk about history, we are used to understanding it as political history. Political history, you can say, is the history of rulers, how dynasties change, how governments change, how different kinds of governments evolve, how uh, kings engage themselves in uh, governance, how they pursue wars, how they conquer territories. This is what part of uh, political history is which is of course connected with economic history, which, which will tell us about the means of production, how uh, livelihoods have changed and how wealth is distributed. Now coming to social history, it is the history of the society. That means it's the history of the people, history of the everyday life of the people. Now this everyday life of the people will consist of their uh, customs, traditions, their livelihoods, of course, the religions, their language. So it's a question of focus. We cannot absolutely put these different histories in watertight compartments. They will merge and intersect. When you talk about social history, we cannot altogether divorce it from political history or economic history. For example, uh, in the medieval period, in 1066, England was occupied by the Normans. The Normans started their rule in England in 1066. That is, you can say, a political event, but it had great repercussions on the society and the economy of the time. The Normans actually brought in this system called the feudal system, which is about giving land for services. The feudal system, so the economic conditions of the people change, uh, and the society also changed. It became a hierarchical society. So we cannot separate these different histories, but it's a question of priorities. Here, in understanding literature, we have to focus on the everyday life of the people. That is what we mean by social history. Now, this literary and social history of England, or English literary and social history, covers a long span of time, from the 5th century to the present. Thankfully, scholars, have divided this long span of, span of time into certain smaller periods. And these periods broadly, which is in sync with your syllabus, are, just look at the slide, the medieval period, first of all, which starts in 450 and ends in 1500. Now this 1500 is the beginning of another great age, the rebirth or reawakening of human society, the Renaissance, which continues up to 1660. Then comes another very important period, uh, not only in English society, in human history as a whole, the Enlightenment. Uh, the Enlightenment means uh, now at the center of human society is not God or religion or faith or providence. Now we are focusing on reason, logic, science, freedom, thinking, etc. This is what the Enlightenment project is. So 1660 to 1785, roughly from the end of the 17th century to, to the end of the 18th century, we call it the Enlightenment. And uh, from the literary point of view, it's called a neoclassical period, neoclassical or neoclassical. So classical rules and classical uh, concerns are emulated in this period of English literature. Next come the 19th century, which of course, clubs together two periods, the Romantic period and the Victorian period. 
then after the Victorian period, we have uh, the modern period. Now modern, ordinarily, by modern, we mean the present or contemporary or of our times. But in social history or cultural history or literary history, um, the word modern is used to refer to a particular period which has its own characteristics and uh, uh, attitudes. The cultural uh, development is what is called modernism. So that modern period is from the early 20th century to the end of the Second World War in 1945. From 1945 to the present, uh, we, uh, we call this period the postmodern period. So this is what, uh, this is the bird's eye view of the periods that you were assigned. So from the beginning of English literature, which starts in the fifth century AD to the present times, uh, this big period, this big span of time, we will have to deal with in our first semester. Now, periods within periods. So we have divided the long span of time into certain broad periods. But within those periods, there are smaller periods. There are tales within tales, uh, stories within stories. So first, let's, let's take up the medieval period, which again will be the period I will be dealing with in my classes. So the medieval period broadly is from 450 AD to 1500 AD. Now this 450 is important because 450 is the start of uh, everything English actually, what we call England today, that English nation began in the middle of the fifth century. It comprised of the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes, the Germanic tribes that invaded England and established their rule in 450 AD after the departure of the Romans. So before 450, England was ruled by the Romans. And uh, they, uh, they were the Celts. The, uh, the earliest inhabitants of England that we know about are the Celts. Those Celts were uh, occupied by the Romans. And uh, the Rom England, Celtic England was an extension of the Roman Empire. The Romans conquered the Celts and ruled over them. The descendants of the Celts are still there in, uh, in, in the United Kingdom. So from in, in around the fifth century, the Romans, because of disturbances at home and also because of the attacks of the Anglo sections and Jews on England, uh, the R Romans departed, they decolonized England, and now England was under another group of people. They were Germanic tribes, Anglo Saxons, and Jews. From there comes the name Anglo Saxons. So 450, 450 to 1500 is the Anglo Saxon period. Sorry, 450 to 1500 is the medieval period from the fall of the uh, Roman Empire to the Renaissance. Within that, we have 450 to 1066 which is called the Old English period or Anglo-Saxon period. Old English, the, uh, as far as the development of the English language is concerned, uh, English language also has certain phases. The language that was used in this phase is called the Old English. And the society was Anglo-Saxon because the elites, the ruling classes were the Anglo-Saxons and Jews. In 1066, there is a turning point. There is a break. 1066, England was conquered by the Normans, a group of people from Normandy in France. Initially, they considered England as their colony, but later they uh, embraced England they, as their own country. So they became what is called resident col colonialist. So from 1066, there's a change in the politics, in the society, in economy, in literature, and culture of this island, which later came to be called England. Now, this period is called the Middle English period or Anglo-Norman. So there is a merging of the anglo sections and the Normans. Germanic culture now blends into Romance culture. Uh, so the French language was initially called Romance uh, because it developed out of Latin, which is a Roman language. Now this Middle English period again has sub-periods. 1066 to 1250, middle of the 13th century, is called a period of religious record. That means the literature of the time was primarily dominantly about religious topics. Then from 1250 to 1350, uh, we have 
other concerns, not just religious. Say love, love ordinary life, etc. come into literary concerns. So this period is called the period of religious and secular literature. Now the most important phase of this Middle English period is the last 50, 50 years from uh, of the 14th century, that is 1350 to 1400. This is the period of great individual writers. Now, before 1350, most of the literary texts were in English, were anonymous, with few exceptions. That means we don't, don't know the names of their writers. After 1350, actually we have the development of the English nation with its distinct characteristics. We also have the development of the standard English language from the blending of the Germanic and the Romance. And in this, in this period that we have some great writers, starting with, of course, the master Geoffrey Chaucer, then there is William Langland, John Gowan. Hence, this period is called the period of great individual writers. Now, after this great days, naturally there will be a slump. This always happens. Now, the next period will be, will be comparative, comparatively barren, but there will be an undercurrent of preparation. It, it is preparing for the next great period in English literature, which is, as we see, the Renaissance or the early mid modern period. The Renaissance covers the span of time from 1500 to 1660. Now, the Renaissance actually started in Italy in the 14th century itself, but by the time it reaches England, uh, it is uh, 1500 uh, or thereabouts. And the Renaissance, you know, is the rebirth or reawakening. Humans, uh, human life had a rebirth or reawakening, uh, as if we are having a second birth. How did this rebirth come? Because uh, during this period, the people came into contact with the uh, classical Greek and Latin writers. They discovered their books and they saw a whole new world. Uh, which is different from the medieval world, which was uh, based on faith, uh, superstitions, hierarchies, etc. Now we have a new age dawning upon our society, the Renaissance. And this led to what is called the humanism, uh, focus on this life rather than the next life or the heaven or hell. It is this focus on this life and the belief in the tremendous potentiality of the human soul or the human being. That is the most important characteristic of the Renaissance. What a piece of work, work is man, says Shakespeare. That is what characterizes the Renaissance spirit. To strive, to seek, to find and not to live. That is the Renaissance uh, spirit. Now, this Renaissance, so the literature of the period will reveal the Renaissance qualities. Marlowe, Shakespeare, etc., will show the tremendous quest for knowledge, the love of beauty, etc., which are characteristic of uh, the, Elizabeth, the Renaissance period. Now, this Renaissance period again is divided into certain subgroups. 1558 to 1603 is called the Elizabethan age, no doubt, from the name of the monarch. Queen Elizabeth I. This is one of the glorious phases in English history, politically, militarily, from the literary point of view, culturally. This was the age which started the English uh, colonial pursuit and the rise of the English Navy. This was the period in which the Spanish Armada was defeated by the English Navy. Again, this was the period when we saw, when we had the growth of Shakespeare tremendous literary outputs. And hence, this, uh, this age uh, is one of the uh, most significant ones in uh, English history, socially, culturally, literally, politically. Then 1603 to 1625, again within the Renaissance, but it is called the Jacobian age uh, from the Latin name of King James. The Latin for, King, uh, Latin for James is Jacobus. 1625 to 1649 is the Carolinese. Now again from Carolus, which is the Latin of King Charles. 1649 to 
1960s from the Commonwealth period. Now here the king is replaced. He is in fact dethroned and the parliament under mm -hmm. Oliver Cromwell rules. This is an important event in human history actually. Uh, the divine origin of kings is here being dismantled. The king could be dethroned. People's will could dominate. So that was the Commonwealth period, very important. So let's go to the next slide. So next comes another significant period in human history, actually, not simply English history, the Enlightenment and the 19th century. The Enlightenment, of course, is from the end of the 17th century to the 18th, end of the 18th century. Now, Enlightenment, what is this Enlightenment? The name itself is inspiring, actually. Now, Providence was at the center of human life for a long time. We, we believed in destiny, in faith, in God, in heaven, in religion. Uh, religion and religious institutions had a great stranglehold on us. Now we began to see a different world altogether. We talked about not providence, but progress. Progress through what? Progress through science, logic, reason, through thinking, democracy. So this is what the enlightenment is. That, is the, that was the social milieu. That was the uh, spirit of the times, the enlightenment. Now, the, that period, strictly speaking in literary terms, is called the neoclassical period, in which, as we said, there was the following of um, the classical literary rules and concerns. 1660 to 1700 is the restoration. That means uh, restoration, of course, is the restoration of monarchy. Uh, the parliament, uh, the commonwealth period is now uh, over and we have the restoration of the king. So such ups and downs come in human society, but on the whole, we are we hope we are progressing. The, this period is also called the age of Dryden, the greatest poet of, or one of the greatest poets of that period. 1700 to 1745 is called the Augustan age, Augustan, uh, emulating the classical Augustan period, golden age. And it is also called the age of Pope, Alexander Pope. 1745 to 1785 is the age of sensibility or age of Dr. Johnson. Then comes the 19th century. The 19th century, 1785 to 1832 is called the Romantic period, another revolutionary period, socially, politically, and also from the point of view of literature. This was the time uh, where when the whole human society was inspired by revolutionary ideals, ideals like liberty, equality, and fraternity. The American War of Independence, the French Revolution, both these two, one a political revolution, the other a social revolution, took place around this time. Uh, and in literature as well in Europe, there was a revolution the, uh, inspired by the same ideas of liberty. And those great poets like Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, Keats, Byron, they were inspired at one time or the other by the especially the French Revolution and overall the revolutionary atmosphere. So that was the Romantic period. From 1832 to 1901 is called the Victorian period, of course, again, from the name of the Empress Queen Victoria, who was also the monarch of England, India, actually. This was the period which consolidated the English colonialism. England now becomes the empire on, on the, over which the sun never set. The Victorian period of uh, socially, uh, it is very important because we see the uh, more and more growth towards democracy, more and more rights were given to the people. And at the same time, uh, more and more countries were colonized. And then this was the period of the um, high point of the industrial revolution. So industries, democratic reforms and colonialism, all these are part of the Victorian period. Now we are coming close to our times, uh, the modern to the present. Now, as I said earlier, the modern period, uh, as far as society or culture or literature is concerned, is you can say the first half of the 20th century. And, and to be precise, up to the end of the Second World War. And after the Second World War, we call it postmodern period. Uh, but there are certain smaller periods like 1901 to 1914 is called the Edwardian period, 14 to 45 is the precise modern period, and after that, postmodern period. 
Now, both modern and postmodern, uh, we'll have to deal with these terms. What are the characteristics? And we'll also have to see what this post means. Does it mean uh, a, re a reaction against the modern? Or does it mean simply after modern? Or does it mean an extension of the modern? Those will be dealt with in our classes. But, for, uh, for, but uh, here, what we had was an overall uh, uh, idea of the whole span of time, dividing uh, that, that time into certain periods and periods within uh, periods within periods actually a lot of uh, periods we have uh, familiarized ourselves with i hope this um, bird's eye view will help you will give you a condition uh, a warm up for the uh, for the classes that are ensuing and we'll have this kind of uh, recorded classes virtual classes and we also have the brick and mortar regular classes in college. Plus, I will be uh, supplying you with reference material through Google Classroom, the, uh, the key to which I'll give you the passwords I'll give you in the classrooms. So uh, we hope uh, this, has been, this has been helpful to you. Uh, thank you once again.